COVID-19 has reinforced the importance of good personal hygiene and clean public spaces. These have always been our priorities and will better prepare us beyond COVID for disease X, which is a matter of not if but when. Over the past two years, we have improved the cleanliness of public spaces from working with premises managers to uphold high cleanliness standards to ensuring individuals practice personal responsibility by returning trays and binning litter. Ms. Nadia Ahmad Samdin would be pleased to know that since the Clean Tables campaign and mandatory Clean Tables regime were implemented, the National Average Tray and Crockery Return Rate, or TCRR, in hawker centres has improved significantly from 33% to 85%. We've also achieved a national average TCRR of above 85% in coffee shops and food courts. Many have shared that the dining environment is now cleaner with faster turnover of tables and fewer incidences of pests and bird nuisance. We will build on this progress to ensure a clean and safe Singapore. We commenced the progressive rollout of the Environmental Sanitation or ES regime last July, which specifies mandatory baseline ES standards for high-risk premises and places greater accountability on premises managers to meet these standards. We introduced the ES regime in more than 3,000 premises under the inaugural phase, including preschools, MOE schools, food centres, markets and coffee shops, and a first tranche of elder care, youth and social service facilities. Together with the sector leads, we developed sector-specific ES standards and trained more than 3,600 environmental control coordinators or ECCs. The ECCs will assist premises managers to develop and oversee the implementation of an ES program, which specifies cleaning frequencies and disinfection protocols. To Ms. Honey So's query, the regime was rolled out to preschools in November 2021 and all have appointed personnel to be ECCs. The ES regime ensures that premises are properly cleaned and disinfected regularly. For example, from March this year, coffee shops are required to carry out thorough cleaning every quarter on top of routine cleaning. This is a marked difference from just ad hoc cleaning before. High touch surfaces would also be cleaned and disinfected more frequently. Premises managers are also sensitized to their responsibility to prevent outbreaks of infectious diseases like gastroenteritis within their premises. For instance, preschools have found the regime useful in providing clear guidance on minimum cleaning and disinfection frequencies and scope of cleaning and disinfection works, neither of which were clearly defined before. Ms. So will be glad to hear that we will implement the regime at another 2,700 premises this year. This would include publicly accessible premises with high footfall, such as large shopping malls, as well as private educational institutions. We have worked out with these sectors to develop sector-specific ES standards. All premises will minimally require an ECC. For large premises with multiple tenants like shopping malls, environmental control officers specified premises will be introduced to oversee more wide-ranging public health issues and management of stakeholders. We aim to train 2,700 more ECCs and ECOs SPs this year. Another important aspect of a clean and safe environment is protecting Singaporeans against the harmful effects of secondhand tobacco smoke. Today, smoking is prohibited in more than 49,000 premises, including covered walkways and common areas of residential buildings. We have prioritized places where secondhand tobacco smoke affects more people, such as community spaces. Ms. Cheryl Chan, Dr. Lim Wee Kiat, Mr. Louis Ng and Ms. Poli San would be glad to hear that together with PUB, NPARCS and the Sentosa Development Corporation, 
NEA will extend the smoking prohibition to more places, including all remaining public parks and gardens, active, beautiful, clean or ABC water sites, and 10 beaches from 1st July 2022. In addition to neighbourhood parks in public and private housing estates where smoking is already prohibited, smoking will be prohibited at regional and city parks like East Coast Park and Fort Canning Park and all park connectors. Smoking will also be prohibited at 10 recreational beaches, including three beaches in Sentosa. With this extension, Singaporeans can enjoy these shared recreational sites without exposure to secondhand tobacco smoke. There will be a three-month advisory period before enforcement commences on 1st October 2022. We currently have no plans to set up additional no-smoking zones. We will review the need for further extensions of the smoking prohibition from time to time. Setting up no smoking zones requires significant stakeholder buy-in and operational resources to implement. We will need to plan extensively, assess the suitability of the precinct and availability of sites for designated smoking areas. On smoking in homes, which Dr. Lim, Ms. Po and Mr. Gan Tian po asked about, legislation is no panacea to curbing secondhand tobacco smoke in homes. There are privacy concerns and technological limitations to gathering evidence required for enforcement. The designated smoking points in Nisun South have thus far not resulted in a sustained reduction in feedback received on smoking in homes in the division since its implementation. Nevertheless, we will continue to monitor the effectiveness of DSPs as localised solutions even as we work with MOH and HPB to discourage smoking at home. On end game laws for smoking, MOH remains open and will study how New Zealand implements the ban, its effectiveness and how their experience would be applicable to Singapore. Besides adopting preventive measures to minimise the spread of infectious diseases, we are building up capabilities to deal with public health threats. Singapore is an early adopter of wastewater surveillance for COVID-19, which is being explored in various countries. In response to Mr. Gan's question, when transmission first occurred at our workers' dormitories, NEA brought in wastewater testing to assess the situation, including the viral loads collected from each dormitory. Our findings were used to complement individual testing, guide infection control measures, and facilitate the progressive clearance of dormitories by the interagency task force. Monitoring has since been expanded to student hostels, nursing homes, and residential sites. From a modest eight sites in May 2020, we gradually expanded surveillance coverage to 200 sites in July 2021. Since February 2022, we have achieved surveillance coverage of 440 sites including 150 sites distributed across residential areas and town centres. We've also expanded our laboratory testing capacity to 4,000 samples being tested per week, up from 2,500 in July last year. As Singapore transits to COVID endemicity, the focus of wastewater testing has shifted from early case detection to providing situational awareness. The data collected alerts government agencies and premises owners or operators of the situation, which allows them to calibrate public health measures. It provides objective information on whether infections among the population are increasing or decreasing, independent of the population's health-seeking behaviour and prevailing clinical test protocols. This will therefore be an important surveillance tool even as we transit to an endemic state. Further research and development will allow the wastewater surveillance system to be used for monitoring other infectious disease threats in the future. 
Mr. Gan asked about improvements to toilet. We launched the Toilet Improvement Program in October 2020 to raise the cleanliness of toilets in hawker centres and coffee shops. The program supported premises in improving toilet design and choice of sanitary fittings for easier cleaning. And coffee shops operators' initial adoption of fortnightly deep cleaning on top of daily cleaning. NEA has received applications from 62 eligible coffee shops and 28 hawker centres. 24 coffee shops and one hawker centre have completed their toilet enhancement works. I will now speak about our hawker culture, my favourite topic. Our hawkers are frontline heroes, providing us affordable hawker food during this pandemic. NEA has provided relief measures to hawkers over the last two years, including 10 months rental waivers and six months subsidies for table cleaning and centralised dishwashing services. Eligible hawkers also received up to $9,000 via the Self-Employed Person Income Relief Scheme, or SERS, in 2020, and a one-off cash payout of $500 under the Market and Hawker Centre Relief Fund last year. We will continue to support our hawkers. Minister for Finance announced that small F&B businesses, one of the sectors most affected by COVID-19, will receive the Small Business Recovery Grant. SFA licensed operators and stallholders in markets, hawker centres, coffee shops, food courts and canteens will receive this grant. They will receive $1,000 for each local employee receiving mandatory CPF contributions, capped at $10,000. Those without local employees will receive a flat $1,000 if they are Singapore citizens or permanent residents. Our efforts have helped hawkers during these tough times. On average, 17 cooked food stall holders, or 0.3%, terminated their leases each month between 2020 and 2021. This is lower than the monthly average of 28 terminations between 2017 to 2019. Ms. Joan Pereira asked if more can be done to help hawkers reduce ingredient costs. We will review her suggestion of bulk purchasing carefully and also consider the interests of our hawkers, where many may already have established relationships and specific arrangements with their suppliers for their preferred ingredients. To prepare hawkers for the digital economy and expand their reach to potential patrons, hawkers, community groups, food delivery platforms, together with NEA and IMDA, came together to form the SG Together Alliance for Action, or AFA, for online ordering for hawkers last June, and developed pilot initiatives to help hawkers utilise online services. About one in every four cooked food stallholders have been supported via NEA's food delivery support scheme. Currently, about half of our 6,000 plus cooked food stallholders are on board these services, and almost 70% of them have adopted e payment. YQ, Deliveroo, Food Panda, and Grab have stepped up to pilot a common acquirer model for online food delivery in 15 hawker centres at zero commission to hawkers. Hawkers can receive online orders from any of these platforms through a single ordering device. Alternatively, they can choose to transact offline through YQ Hawker Captains. To date, 18 hawker centres have set up digital support for hawkers groups, which provide peer support to help less digitally savvy hawkers embrace digital opportunities. This includes creating Facebook pages for each centre, facilitating online community group buys, and organising bulk meal orders. I'm pleased to share that many of my fellow members of parliament have adopted AFA's recommendations on group buys from hawkers for our lunch lunches during parliament sittings. For today's lunch, many of us enjoyed wonton noodles, chicken rice, and burgers from Commonwealth Crescent, Bukit Merah, and Golden Mile. More enticing and mouth-watering hawker dishes to come. 
Ms Nadia asked for an update on the Hawker Centre's Transformation Programme, or HTP. Last year, I shared plans about the HTP to future-proof Hawker Centre infrastructure. While HTP will be applied to new and redeveloped centres, we are also piloting it at two existing centres, even as they face constraints with limited floor space. I'm pleased to announce that we will consult stakeholders, including hawkers associations, town councils and advisors in 2022 to jointly develop the HTP pilot at Gelang Serai Market and Cheng San Market and Food Centre. The proposed scope of works may include high volume, low speed fans to improve ventilation, provisions to support flexible implementation of safe management measures such as quick deployment and removal of temporary excess control, reconfiguration of tables and chairs to reduce crowding, and additional hand-washing hand facilities to raise hygiene levels. Finally, our hawker culture would not exist without our hawkers. On Mr Don Wee's query, there has been healthy demand for hawker stalls with high occupancy rates averaging consistently at about 97% at existing and new hawker centres. NEA has also been receiving enquiries from individuals who are keen to take up stalls at the new centres, and the monthly tender of vacant stalls at existing centres have continued to attract a good number of bids. Ms Pereira asked about efforts to attract new hawkers, including improving job prospects and working conditions. Our hawkers today are mostly self-employed individuals with the flexibility and autonomy to decide their operating hours based on what they sell. They are covered by MediShield Life and can also top up their medical insurance individually or even explore purchasing together as a group through their hawkers associations. We've been helping our aspiring hawkers prepare for the trade through the Incubation Store Program and the Hawkers Development Program and similar programs by socially conscious enterprise hawker centre operators. Over 40 new hawkers have joined the trade through these programs. Their median age is 33, significantly lower than the overall median age of hawkers of 60. 11 aspiring hawkers are currently operating incubation stores, with another six awaiting allocation of incubation stores. Some of our new hawkers include Ms. Priscilla Huang, age 31, of Authentic Hong Kong Delights, and Mr. Lim Wei Kiat, age 27, of Akiat Chicken Rice, who joined the hawker trade over the past year after completing HDP. In addition to Wei Kiat's chicken rice, which we had for lunch just now, I've ordered mochi and water chestnut cakes from Priscilla for Parliament's tea break today. A few others like Ms. Amber Pong, age 32, of the Headless Baker at Gimmo Market, who converted to a full-fledged hawker after completing her incubation store program, even opened a second outlet in July last year. To ensure that veteran hawkers' recipes and skills are not lost, the Hawker Succession Scheme, or HSS, which was shared last year, will link retiring hawkers without succession plans but who wish to pass on their businesses, skills and recipes to aspiring hawkers. To Ms. Barrera and Mr. Raj, Joshua Thomas's question about the HSS, a 10-member independent advisory panel has been set up to work with NEA to support and review the HSS pilot. Among the 10 panelists, six are established hawkers. The rest include culinary chefs, hawker centre operators, and culinary training partners. The panellists will help identify suitable veteran hawkers, assess aspiring successors' readiness, and provide feedback to improve the programme. Under the pilot, aspiring hawkers will be assessed on culinary skills and capacity to learn before pairing up with veteran hawkers. They will undergo a three-month apprenticeship under the veteran hawkers. Aspiring successors will be evaluated on their ability to execute the veterans' signature dishes. When needed, veteran hawkers may continue to mentor the successor for two additional months. 
In recognition of their time and effort spent, veteran hawkers will receive a nominal stipend of up to $5,500. This is but a token of appreciation and is not a measure of the effort that veterans have invested into establishing their clientele and refining their recipes. The HSS is not intended to be a commercial arrangement, but is an option to help retiring veteran hawkers find suitable successes and preserve their culinary legacy for future patrons. We will also introduce safeguards to protect the interests of the veteran hawkers, such as requiring successes to serve the veteran hawkers' signature dishes and retain their stall names for three years. Mr. Gunn and Mr. Wee asked about the construction progress of new hawker centres. While COVID-19 has caused some delay, four new centres, namely Bukit Canberra, Fernvale, Wan Pongo and Senja hawker centres will begin operations by the third quarter of this year. In addition, five more centres in the construction stage will progressively be completed in the next few years and two more are in the planning and design stage. Residents in Tampines Town can also look forward to another new hawker centre. More details of this new centre will be shared in due course. Ms Nadia will be glad to hear that upcoming centres will incorporate sustainability features. All new centres will have food waste digesters. Some will also have solar panels. Two redeveloped centres will also be starting operations this year. Market Street Hawker Centre, that used to be at Golden Shoe Car Park, will open for business from 1st April at levels 2 and 3 of the Integrated Development Capita Spring on Market Street and continue to provide affordable food options for those working in the CBD. We also expect Margaret Drive Hawker Centre, which replaces the Hawker Centre at Blocks 1A, 2A, 3A Commonwealth Drive to commence operations from the fourth quarter of 2022. Chairman in Mandarin, please. Guojia Huan Jing Ji, Jiang Jing Yi Bu, Kuo Da, Jing Yan Ling Fan Wei, Chong Chi Ye Yi Ri Chi, Woman Jiang Jing Zi, Ming Zong, Zai Ru, Dong Hai An Gong Yuan, Fu Kan Ning Gong Yuan, Den Chi Yi, He Si Chi Gong Yuan, Yi Ji Lian Jie, Ge Ge Gong Yuan, Den Gong Yuan Lian Dao Shang, Si Yan. Jing Yan Ling Fan Wei, Ye Jiang Bao Kuo, Hoyet,美丽,清洁,水源计划,下的,休闲设施,以及包括圣淘沙岛上,三个沙滩在内的十个休闲海滩。在过去的两年里,政府通过各种方式援助支持我们的小贩。这包括免去总共十个月的租金
有四个新的小贩中心开始营业，他们分别在五级班让、三八旺、盛港和板儿，将为这些市政的居民提供更多的饮食选择和便利。我们也将会在丹比尼增建一个小贩中心，详情我们之后会再公布。最后，马吉街熟食中心。也将从四月一日起迁回原址，在新发展的综合项目 Capital Spring 的二三楼重新开业。所有原来在金协中心的摊贩也都会回到重新开业的马吉街熟食中心。Chairman, despite the challenges of the pandemic, everyone, be it the cleaning industry, Premises managers or hawkers have demonstrated resilience, seized opportunities to improve cleanliness, and embrace new business opportunities online. Let us continue to work together to build a truly SG clean Singapore, and safeguard our hawker culture for future generations. Indeed, support SG hawkers. <laughs>